first heard Dr. Dixon speak at a gathering of agencies that are in support of the hunger work that's done in our county through the Worcester County Food Bank. What Dr. Dixon may not know is that my introdu introduction to UMass Memorial 16 years ago when I came into the community was at a time when the hospital was looking at having to make some very difficult cuts and decisions and one of the things that they were considering reducing was the pastoral care department and I had been sent in on the part of the Worcester County Ecumenical Council as the local clerical junkyard dog <clears throat> to uh, see if we could make that not happen and it didn't happen and so part of my desire to have Dr. Dixon here today personally was to make amends for my behavior 16 years ago which may have in fact sullied the reputation of the Unitarian Universalists in the area as being too fierce to contend with. The other part of it is that I was impressed with Dr. Dixon's uh, resume, with his passion, with his compassion, and as a former emergency medical technician, someone that I look to with a great deal of knowledge and experience in the art of emergency medicine. Dr. Eric Dixon is president and CEO of UMass Memorial Healthcare, which is the largest healthcare system in central and western Massachusetts. UMass Memorial is committed to improving the health of people in central New England through excellence in care, com comprehensive health services, teaching, research, and clinical trials through its partnership with UMass Medical School. UMass Memorial System of Care includes these outstanding hospitals in the region's trusted academic medical center. No matter where you receive health care services within the UMass Memorial System, you have access to advanced technology resources and services at its hospital. It is an absolute delight that we would hear from Dr. Dixon today and we would have an opportunity to celebrate with him what I consider to be one of the grand jewels of our community, UMass Memorial Healthcare. Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Eric Dixon. Well, thank you everyone for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. I'm, I'm always reminded when I have a chance to speak to community groups that it's a chance for uh, me to speak to um, the owners of UMass Memorial Healthcare. UMass Memorial Healthcare is a 501c3, a not-for-profit organization. And because of that, we are owned by the communities in which we serve. And so t today, I'm, I'm having the opportunity to speak to my bosses in, in, in many ways and talk to you about what we're doing with your healthcare system. And uh, as CEO of that healthcare system, I feel like it's my obligation to take the resources of UMass Memorial Healthcare and use them to deliver the maximum benefit and the maximum value to our communities. Um, and that's, that's the way all of our not-for-profit organizations should be thinking about the role of our healthcare systems. It's, it's been uh, a challenging year. I guess it's a 16-year cycle that we, uh, we go through these big transitions where there's financial uh, challenges and, and have to make uh, difficult decisions and difficult cuts. I'm glad that I didn't uh, try to cut the pastoral department this year because the junkyard dog would be <laughs> at my door and he knows where I, where I work. So um, <clears throat> we serve the community in three different ways primarily. Uh, first, we educate the next generation of physicians uh, at the medical school and support that through UMass Memorial. Healthcare is the primary teaching site for UMass Medical School, the state's medical school. We, we look for new innovative ways through research to cure disease and take better care of patients in terms of our, our, our research divisions. But perhaps most importantly, and certainly most important for me as the CEO of the healthcare system, is we serve as the safety net, the clinical safety net for central Massachusetts, the backstop, right? And I, 
most people that have spent some time in this region, I've spent essentially my entire career at, at UMass and UMass Memorial as a medical student, as a resident in emergency medicine, and as a practicing physician and now CEO, um, uh, working in our trauma center. And uh, as, as, as everybody in the region knows, is that when you get really sick and when something bad happens, regardless of your ability to pay, UMass will be there. And uh, I, I had the great privilege yesterday of <clears throat> going to what is called our celebration of life for our transplant patients, 110 transplants done at UMass Memorial last year. And a woman uh, came up and gave a talk, uh, and as she had her kind of one year post-transplant celebration at the, our celebration of life. And she told her story, and her story was that <coughs> She was at, she's a single mother, she was at Beth Israel and had been diagnosed with a horrible disease, a, a, a blood clot in her liver that basically melted her liver away from a disease um, called hemochromatosis. And um, she was told at the hospital that she needed to find uh, new parents for her child because she only had a couple of weeks. And as she was leaving the hospital, one of the doctors at BI said, you should go to UMass and you should see if their transplant program can help you. And I'm sorry, I get a little choked up. And there was not a dry eye yesterday, I can tell you, when she told her story. And there she sat a year later with her daughter. And she looked at me at the end of this and said, your hospital saved my life. And I said, it's your hospital. I just manage it for you. And I hope the people in this audience, in this community, recognize that. It's your health care system. I manage it for you. And, uh, and that's my job. And I'm, I, it takes just one or two events like I had yesterday to make it any trouble and any challenges that we have to go through all worthwhile. And we are a community resource. And every one of our people are dedicating to serving this community. And, and doing whatever it needs, whether it be running the trauma center, preparing for Ebola and the horrible crisis that's occurring in West Africa and the potential that we could have cases uh, in Massachusetts or, or transplanting patients. Um, that's what we're there for. The, the healthcare system recently has been challenged, challenged in part because of the tremendous pressure on all healthcare systems to improve the quality of care that we deliver and reduce the cost. And if there is one theme in healthcare right now that we're all feeling, it's we want higher quality care at a lower cost. And I'm gonna show you why through the, the Affordable Care Act was created, the Chapter 224 in Has Massachusetts, and that there's been so much legislation and so much change in the industry and why there is so much intense pressure, especially to bring that cost of care down. Because uh, it's warranted, and, and it needs to happen, and we do need to deliver higher quality care for less. Now, I don't know you don't want me to talk for an hour here. I often say I have two versions of this talk, the 60-minute the version and the one-hour version. But I'm going to try to just <laughs> a, run through a couple of slides in a short period of time so that we can get to a dialogue phase and you can ask some questions rather than me just showing you a, a PowerPoint. So do forgive me if I blow past some slides pretty, pretty quickly. I'm going to talk about the cost of health care in the United States today, and I'm going to talk about how to reduce it. Those two things, that's my goal. <coughs> so before I can do that, I need to talk about the business model of health care. Because it is this model that has created the problem that we have today. This, this way that we pay to supposedly keep people healthy and provide health care. Uh, these are the people or the parties that pay for health care. Employers, patients, and the government. Now, in a rare situation when we have Medicaid, Medicare and Medicaid where um, uh, the payer of care pays the provider of care down here at the bottom directly. And the cost of that is about 3% for Medicare and about 3% for us in terms of the transition to go from the people that are paying for care to the people that are providing the care 
and fund that. And they don't pay to keep people healthy. They only pay when people get sick. And that's part of the problem here. The more we do in our health care system to keep people health care, to practice health care, the less we get paid. So you, right away you see there's a financial incentive in the business model of health care to not keep people healthy. There is, and, and that's fundamentally uh, the problem. Now, most of the dollars do not pass directly to the providers of care. They go through an intermediate health care company, typically an HMO. And the HMO will package up services to the providers and take 10 to 15 percent of that premium dollar off the top before it gets to the providers of care. And then when we're working with one of these intermediate companies, it costs us somewhere around 10 percent just to collect the money and to fill out the pre-authorization forms and to review the denials. So when you think about the cost, the total cost of health care, before I ever put my stethoscope on a patient, there's a huge cost that goes into just the transaction between the customer and the provider of the service. And you find, find me another industry where that is the case, that you have somewhere in the range of 20, 20 uh, to 25 percent of the, the dollars disappear before any service is ever provided. And, and that is part of the problem, and it's part of the solution, too. And in terms of if we can get this group here aligned with this group, to provide the maximal value to the customers up here, we can take a lot of the costs out of healthcare. And if we can simplify the regulations as well. <clears throat> so how much does healthcare cost in the United States? This is the per capita, per person cost of healthcare in the United States versus the rest of the industrialized nations down here. Twice as much. We spend twice as much on healthcare as the rest of the industrialized uh, world. And there is no evidence, except for in trauma care and high acuity care, that we provide any better care to, to the patients that we serve versus those other nations. If you think about it from a federal government perspective of where the government is spending its money, this here, this 24% that goes into Medicare, is the fastest growing segment of the federal spend. And it's crowding out what we spend dollars on for everything else. Now look at this graph. This is Social Security and Medicare. We've all been paying into these systems through payroll deductions our entire careers, plus our employers have been paying into them for us. We expect that we're going to have our coverage when we turn 65. Um, military, interest on debt. Where's K through 12 education on this slide? 2%. Two percent. Two percent. Right, so I showed this slide to um, one of my Japanese fellows who was doing research with us, and he said, it seems like in America you are, you are investing in the elderly at the expense of the young. Now, and, and, and fundamentally, he's right. Now, we've all paid into this, and we expect to have Medicare and Medicaid when we hit 65. That's what we were told. The problem is, is because of the high, high cost of health care in the United States, we didn't pay enough. Because we're living longer, we didn't pay enough. And the unfunded portion of Medicare, if you look at the 10,000 10, baby boomers every year that are coming out and aging into, into Medicare, the unfunded amount for the nation is $37.9 .9 trillion. This far outweighs the threat to the finances of the United States than does our national debt. This fundamentally can cripple the nation financially over time. Now that's the federal government and that's their problem. I have a problem in UMass Memorial Healthcare and anybody in here that runs a business or owns a business has a problem is an employer-based program that you have to pay, you tend to pay a portion of your employees' healthcare costs. What do you think it costs me per employee that I hire for health care? Over $14,000, almost $15,000 per employee. I'm complaining about the health care cost, and I'm the highest cost provider of care in Worcester. We spend more on the health care for our employees than we do on the drugs that we give to our patients to make them better. 
our health care spending costs in UMass Memorial Health Care is about $120 million per year. Our pharmacy costs are about $100 million a year. Think about that. If you're Chrysler, if you're Chrysler and you're making cars, you put more dollars into the cost of health care for your employees than you do for the steel that goes into the car. How do you compete with a car manufactured in Japan where the health care cost is almost a third of the United States? If I, could, if I can pick on Chris from Polar Beverage, how does he compete in a global marketplace to sell his beverages if his cost of care is to, for his employees is so much higher? He has to add that cost into the cost of his product. I have to add it into the cost of our service. So it's not only going to potentially cripple the government if we don't do something this, it's going to cripple our industries. And how do we do in Massachusetts in terms of the cost of care, right? A lot of people think we have the best health care in the nation. I've got some statistics that say we're good but not that good. Average cost per everyone in the United States is $6,800. $15. The number I showed you before for my people includes many family plans and things like that. So each time I hire an employee, I'm covering more than one life. Uh, average cost for everyone is $6,815 in Massachusetts across the nation. In Massachusetts, it's $9,200. It's the highest cost per uh, person in the nation. And we can adjust it for lots of different things. It's still going to be the highest cost per person in the nation. And that means that our companies that are thinking about moving to Massachusetts and building um, uh, or making a product here or providing a service here are looking at that cost and say, maybe I want to go somewhere else. Maybe I want to build my plant somewhere else or, or, or create our offices somewhere else. So we in Massachusetts have a particular, particular problem. I, I often say that what we're paying for in healthcare in the United States is this Lexus, and what we're getting is this Chevy Chevette. <laughs> and, um, it, and we, w I don't mind, I, in fact, I encourage everybody to spend a lot on healthcare because that's my business. You know, and a, a lot of people say, we don't mind paying more for healthcare in the United States, but we want the Lexus, right? And the question is, how do we get that, right? What can we do to get that care? And the reason is because of the total disintegration of the way we deliver care in the United States is one of the biggest things. I showed you that business model up at the top, and everybody's working for themselves. The MRIs are over here. The, 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 um, the rehabs are over on the side here for patients post-hospital care trying to get make as much as they can. They're not thinking about going back to the primary care doc and coordinating care. And, and, and I don't know if any of you have been frustrated by the fact that you go to one doctor, you go to a different hospital, you get an imaging study somewhere uh, and along the way, and nobody puts it all together to deliver maximal value. Often I, I, I work in an emergency department, a patient comes in, they're transferred to one from one of the community hospitals in the region, and uh, they had a CAT scan in the community hospital. I say, you get the CAT scan? No, they didn't send it. That's all right. Get another CAT scan, right? There we go. Because it's not that coordination. And, and, I, and I think that the, part of the thing, that, what would has to happen is all the assets in the community, Milford Hospital, Harrington Hospital, um, our hospitals, our, our five hospitals, St. Vincent's, everyone has to work together in terms of coordinating the care in a region, including the payers of the care. And that's where you're really going to get uh, a greater value. That's how you get your Lexus. So there's been a tremendous pressure on us to bring care down. And typically what has happened is uh, the, the, the government knows all these numbers, and they worry about these, and the legislature worries, and it says, let's pass a law, and let's um, add a bunch of regulations, because that will help bring the cost of care down. Uh, and let's pass a bunch of laws to try to fix that business model, right? And so the Affordable Care Act and the push towards something called accountable care organizations, where we won't pay them for, per procedure anymore. We'll give them kind of a global payment to keep somebody healthy. And then um, if they spend more than that, 
they have to, the, the, the providers of care will have to eat it. That's what we call capitation. A move towards that, provided people with a single payment for a year, this is what happens if you're an insurance company, and if you spend more than that you, on, on your patients, then, uh, then you have to eat that cost. If you spend less than that, then you get to keep it and that's your profit if you're an insurance company. Um, the problem is they give that to the insurance companies instead of the providers of care, and now you've got the insurance company, your insurance company trying to manage your health instead of the provider trying to manage your health. And when those two come together that, and work together, uh, that's when you can drive some of the, the costs out of care. Now, there are thankfully examples across the United States of where organizations have been able to drive costs down significantly. And, um, and I, I look to La Crosse, Wisconsin. This is Medicaid best beneficiary. So Medicaid beneficiary has a cost of care about twice the cost of a, a non-Medicaid beneficiary. And uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin has the lowest cost per care of any uh, zip code in, in the nation. And it's because the community got together and decided to ask some basic questions related to end of life care. And not how do you want to die? How do you want to live the last uh, uh, two years of your life? How do you want to live the last six years uh, of, of your life? And the, the key to their dropping care was to keep people out of the hospital and, to, uh, and keep them home uh, more and deliver on their wishes of, of <coughs> the end of life. Uh, people that know me well, I live on a wonderful little farm in Princeton, Massachusetts, facing Mount Wachusett. And every one of my family knows the same thing. I want to die at home. I want to die at home facing my mountain, and I want to be buried in the backyard where I buried all my best friends, my dogs, over the years. Right? <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and that's what I want. And, um, uh, and that, and that, but 67% of the people in Massachusetts want that. Right? And, uh, but only 30% of the people in Massachusetts get that because they've never had that conversation. And <clears throat> I've told my wife that, I, who's also an emergency physician, a dozen times. That's what I want. That's what I'll, I'll, go, I'll, I'll go in peace if I get that. Um, <clears throat> and she said, you know, you never asked me what I wanted. And I said, well, I just assumed the same thing. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> And she told me what she wanted, and it was quite different, uh, in, in fact. So, uh, but but that but the, what they've done in La Crosse, Wisconsin, is ask the question, document it, and then pr give people what they want at the end of life. Um, this isn't about death panels. This is about providing to the patients what they want. And uh, I've spent so much of my life in a hospital. So much of my life in a hospital. I don't want to spend my last few days there. That, that's, that's what I've always said. And I think that's true for a lot of other people. So by doing that, you can significantly drop the cost of care. Now what I would call for is for everybody in this room and everybody across that uh, community to have the, the same conversation with their family and, and the people that are gonna be asked to make decisions on your behalf and, uh, and have it before you get sick. Um, and, and, and that, that's all, that's the, that's the key here. Uh, the other wonderful uh, healthcare system that has uh, provided higher qual quality of care for less than I want to talk about is Green Bay, Wisconsin. Bell & Healthcare is the primary um, healthcare company. I used to love Green Bay, Wisconsin up until last Sunday. Uh, <laughs> the, I, uh, I, I went out and I, I had uh, dinner at Lambeau Field when I was um, out there. They, the what game wasn't going on. They had the Bell & Healthcare entrance to Lambeau Field. They're actually, you'd, you'd like the people in Green Bay, and if you lived in Green Bay, you'd love the Packers too. Just a little bit tough last week. And what Bell & Healthcare figured out is that all people do not use, utilize healthcare resources at the same rate. In fact, it's 5% of the population that uses 50% of the healthcare resources in the United States. And so if you want to drop the care, the cost of care for that population, don't focus on the 95% of healthy people that are doing just fine. Focus on the 5% of people with chronic disease, congestive heart failure, diabetes, asthma, 
emphysema, those types of things, and, do, and, and coordinate that care. Wrap all of that care together such that, uh, that for the patient, you're focused on keeping them home and healthy and their chronic disease managed and keeping them out of the hospital. That's a big win for a person with chronic disease, if you know anybody. Nobody really wants to be in the hospital, right? Everybody would rather be home and healthy. So what they did is they, they did something through a pioneer ACO pro program, Accountable Care Organization program, and they divided up their population of 20,000 patients that they were now accountable for the total cost of care. And they said, let's figure out who the sickest people are and let's provide them the best health care they've ever had in their lives. And that's that 729 people out of the 29,000. And by providing great health care, coordinating the care, giving them a care navigator that would check in with the patient every day. Joe, how are you doing? Did you check your weight? You know, if your weight is going up, your, TA, your congestive heart failure is going to get worse. Calling each of the patients, those 729 patients every day, making sure that every time they went to a doctor, that one doctor knew what the other doctor did uh, and, and had done and how they changed their medications previously. By doing that, they dropped the cost of care for the entire population by 5%. Most successful accountable care organization uh, in the country. And so if you want to drop, and so what we need to do is, is move away from the payment system that those really chronically ill patients with lots of problems that don't want to be going to the doctor 10 times uh, a, a, a week we, that we pay for that care in a different way and that we focus attention on them. We did a pilot program called uh, uh, Navicare with Fallon, which is for patients with a, a significant um, uh, problems eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. And one of the most remarkable things happened, I've never seen it happen in medicine before. Uh, the, a patient had been admitted three times to the, through the emergency department for leg swelling and, and assumed in, infection of the legs. Right. Each of those admissions cost about $10,000. And because we did this pilot program where we were working with the payer and the provider of care and put case managers from the payer right in our clinics, uh, the primary care saw the patient back and they said, you know, you've got to keep your legs elevated to the patient. You've got to keep your legs elevated or you're going to end up in the emergency department again. $10,000. She said, I can't. I, I, I'm, I, don't, I don't have any place in my house I need a recliner. I can't afford a recliner, a $500 recliner, right? Three visits, three admissions to the emergency department, $30,000 for admissions. Why? Because you couldn't, because she couldn't get a $500 recliner. And so the payer was right there, and the payer's paying that $30,000. I'm collecting it on the other side. And they said, well, let's get her a recliner. And they could do that because they had the flexibility in the payment system. She got a recliner, she never ended up back in the emergency department again. Her life was better, the payer was the ma major beneficiary of this, and frankly, we don't want to admit patients that, don't need, a that need a recliner. We want them home. And, uh, and, and just wonderful stories like that uh, are coming out. We have a program up at Community Health Link over on Queen Street, if you know the old Worcester City campus. I know people uh, in here will remember like me when uh, Worcester City was open where we had a patient that had 200 emergency department visits in a year. 200. I don't go, I'm an <coughs> ER doc. I don't go to work 200 times a year in the, uh, uh, the ER. And, and, and it was the same thing over and over again. It was, a, it was a pancreas problem and severe pain. She'd start to get in pain. She'd worry that she was going to be home alone, that nobody would be there for us. She'd call 911. She'd get an ambulance ride in there and that the pain got worse, she'd be there. And what they did uh, through Community Health Link was every day they checked in with her and every day they told her, if you start to have pain, just call us, we're gonna be there for you. If you need to go to the emergency department, we'll send you to the emergency department, but you can come in and see us. And every day somebody checked in with her and reassured her that if there was a problem, they were gonna be there for her and if that could, they couldn't fix it, they'd send her to the emergency department. Went down to 15 emergency department visits uh, the next year. Now, this is a person with very severe bad disease. Um, so, uh, you know, it is possible. It is possible, but it requires a couple of things. And uh, the biggest of which is that the community has to come together and recognize that we are your healthcare system. Fallon 
uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, Harvard Pilgrim Tufts, you are the owners of them as well. Those are our not-for-profit health plans in the region. They have to come together and put all the community resources together, the food banks, the free clinics, and they have to start to think about moving away from this rescue care model where we just wait for people to get sick to a true health care model. We have to have that conversation about end of life. We have to figure out who those high utilizers of care are, and we have to intervene before they end up in the emergency department. I'm going to end there and say thank you once again for the opportunity to speak with you and uh, be happy if we have time, I'm not sure if we do, to answer any questions that you might have. Please. Unbelievable. I'm, you know, I mean, I, 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 I'm jealous because PACE program is Fallon Community Health Plan. Fallon is probably our, our, our it's our community health plan, right? It's Worcester's community health plan uh, that they did it and we didn't do it. And so what the PACE program is, and I, I might not be doing it uh, justification, is it's, it's a medical home for frail elderly. And what it typically allows is um, a, a an elderly person to live at home often with a family. The family drops the person off in the morning uh, uh, it, at, at the PACE program at the Summit Elder Care and their primary care doc is there, there's case management there, they connect with their specialists, but they also do activities, they recognize if something, they intervene with any problem that might be going on early. Well the family member that t the el elderly person typically works with goes to work makes their living to support their home, and then comes and picks them up on the way home. Or so they actually have dropped them off, too. They have a bus. And I, and I just, um, I, I say to Patrick Hughes, one of my favorite people in the, uh, uh, the area, um, that this is exactly it. They're not just, in that case, Fallon is not just the payer. They're the provider. And, um, and he, just, uh, he just glows when he talks about the PACE program. It's exactly, exactly where we need to go. He's got the PACE program. We've got the program at Community Health Link, which is for a different population. If people understand um, what Queen Street in that area is like and the population that lives in that uh, region, uh, very underserved. But it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. And, and the, the, most importantly, the lives of those people and those families are greatly improved uh, and the cost of care goes down. What more can we ask for? Thank you for the question. Please. Kind of experience. someone coming into a hospital, why there wasn't some type of digital recording of this person, or and, and is, it a pro, is it a small problem, so, a large problem? I think if, if they had gone into Kmart and used your identity and your card, there probably would have been a camera focused on them. You could have identified it. And I actually had an identity theft case. Somebody that I was in the Army with, we wrote our Social Security numbers on everything when in the Army, stole my Social Security number. And, um, and we caught him, he got caught, which made it much easier to deal with it because he went to a department store. You know, there was Eric Dixon, but it was an Eric Dixon uh, uh, kind of thing. Uh, in healthcare, uh, we are very limited in our ability to put video cameras out about who can come in. There's an entire regulation called HIPAA uh, and to record patients coming and providing a service. So that's probably, it, uh, because they chose health care, um, uh, it probably you know, <coughs> made it harder to catch the person than if they were buying something at Target. And identity theft is, uh, is a horrible problem uh, in the United States in terms of you know, we, uh, we've had breaches. Uh, there's been breaches at Home Depot, Target, and uh, multiple other places. But uh, I, don't, I haven't heard a lot of cases of people come in and saying that wasn't really me that got the health care. Yeah, but um, uh, I, I, uh, sorry, <laughs> I, uh, I hope it doesn't happen to anybody else. Doctor, I enjoyed your presentation today very Thank much, you. and I could uh, certainly relate to home care that you discussed. I spent many years care for my wife until she passed early this year. But my main question to you today is: you mentioned that at the end of the talk that we should.
should all get together, the hospitals and the community, the HMOs, and get together and, and try to reduce the cost. When I go out of here today, when everyone else goes out of here today, who's going to initiate something like that? The, um, the end of life discussion, particularly the whole thing. Bringing everything together, the HMOs, yeah. the middle people, yeah. the, the people, the healthcare systems. When we go out of here today, we heard what you said. Me. That's the answer, or yeah. us. At, uh, you know, for it is. I, I, I feel like, as as the CEO of the largest healthcare provider in in this region, that when I look at our numbers of what the cost of care is in Central Massachusetts, that there is no single individual more responsible for that result than 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 the person that has in, in the role now and before me and before him. Um, and there is nobody that has more of a responsibility to to bring that cost down and improve the quality. And so, you know, all of the things that we've talked about, uh, we are actively doing. We are actively trying to get out to community uh, meetings and have the discussion about end of life care. We are trying <coughs> to bridge the, the the relationship with the health plan so that we're, uh, you know, these two community assets are no longer fighting with no one another about what the rate is that we're, we're, we're fighting about how to take better care of our patients. Um, and so I feel responsible and part of the reason I do a lot of these, um, I call them chicken dinners, uh, is because I, uh, to get out to, the, to the, the people in the community and say this is where we need to go and get on your support. Uh, often when I'll be in the, uh, one of these meetings, there'll be board members for some of the other healthcare companies, there'll be board members for the HMO. There'll be people that work in those. There'll be conversations that happen after this meeting where well, there'll be that pressure to say, you know what, how, how are you working together? And, and the sad part for me always is, is uh, all of the assets, almost all of the assets in Massachusetts, the healthcare assets in Massachusetts, um, are community property. And, and you just want them to work together to, to, to and, and that's what the message I always have when I'm out there working with one of the, the partners that we have and trying to do this. We have a moral and ethical obligation to work together to provide the most value possible to our communities. By, by taking on these roles as CEOs of a not-for-profit, that's our obligation. We shouldn't have taken the job if we were only about our little piece. And, uh, you know, so more and more in these conversations are happening. And I, somebody did mention F Fallon and the PACE program. I got to tell you, this, I, I found no greater partner in Worcester than Patrick Hughes, the CEO, who would, would say the same thing. And so we are working together. And uh, once we recognize that's our eth moral and ethical obligation, we have to do it. And I'm sorry, uh, uh, I'll go this way, uh, left to right, if I may. may. Well, uh, in addition to the moral incentive, is it, can there be some kind of financial incentive to encourage people to work together, uh, to encourage capitated systems to uh, be implemented? I, I think you, you need something on a financial end in addition, perhaps, to the moral part. Yeah. And I think it's what, uh, I, there's an old Irish proverb, uh, if you want to get over a wall, throw your hat over it and then go get it, something along those lines. And so with our new company, our newest company in UMass Memorial Healthcare is our a UMass Memorial ACO, Inc., Accountable Care Organization, Inc., um, which is exactly trying to go into this model of care for our Medicare beneficiaries. And we, all the accountants and the, we got together and we looked at this and it's going to cost us $2 million a year to do this. And what do they calculate out? Return on investment. And that number had a big bracket around it. And I said, well, I guess we won't do it then. And I, I, and I said, we have to do it. Right? We have to move in this direction. So if we don't, if we, if we never throw our hat over the wall, we're never getting to the other side. So um, we, we uh, started that company. We took, we're now taking risk on uh, 25,000 Medicare beneficiaries. Um, because of exactly what to, you, you described, until we say we're going to do it, until we, um, uh, you know, and throw our hat over the wall, we ju it just won't happen. And so, <coughs> we've done that now with a, um, about 40,000 Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, uh, beneficiaries, and we're moving in that direction. 
and every step of the way, I, I, I depend on the bean counters because I'm a physician executive, not, a, not an MBA type. Every step of the way, the bean counters are saying, you can't do it, you can't do it. And I say, we have to do it. We have to do it. It's the only way we're ever going to get to the point that we provide higher quality care for less. I'm going to go one, two, and then three and four, if I have time for four. We, we, uh, we have to cap it somewhere. Four is it. Four is it. OK. If you, I'm one. You are one. You always work, Frank. But when we're at showing the cost for per individual by state, it was quite stark to me. The Northeast corner, us particularly in the Northeast Pennsylvania, black. The West Coast, California, white. Now, in many ways, we're comparable. There's a high, there's high income. There are a lot of people. Urban areas with medical facilities. Not that they do doing something particularly well in California. Yeah, well, they must be because they got the lowest cost for, for care in the region. That bottom. Uh, a quartile. Some of it is demographics, age of the population, that sort of thing. So that's one of the correction factors. But if you think about um, what really what's occurring out here in California, they have the biggest integrated delivery system in the country called Kaiser Permanente. They dominate the healthcare marketplace in that region. And Kaiser is exactly what I've been talking about: this integrated delivery system. They are the provider. They are the insurer. And so they've come together and, um, and to, to be able to, to, and they go directly to the employers and they say, this is what it'll cost per, per month to cover your employees. And so, you know, there's a little bit, people will say there's some rationing in there, but they really coordinate all the care related to that population. And something happens in a marketplace when you have world-class competition. You, everybody either catches up or they're out. They're out of the game. And so all of the other providers and payers in this marketplace have to keep up with Kaiser in terms of their ability. So if, if you're a fragmented provider or payer in that, in that marketplace, you have a hard time competing. And so all of, them, all of the other payers and providers are starting to coalesce in that marketplace. And uh, competition drives greater results. And they all, uh, and and that is a, a big part of for California. The other part, and this is a little bit scary, where do you, who do you, what do you think, which state do you think has the highest number of doctors per capita? Massachusetts. Massachusetts, right? We produce the most per capita, we have the most per capita. So when you, and this is scary, the more doctors you have, the more health care you get, right? <laughs> uh, and, <coughs> And in those states where you have a low number of doctors per capita, you get less health care, and it costs less. Now, the, the sad part is if you look at the quality of care, it's not any different. Right? And th there is a health care economist that says, if you really, the United States really wants to um, in, in reduce the cost of care, they should take about a third of the doctors and ship them over to Africa. And, should, and by doing so, you'll improve the health in <laughs> both, the, uh, both continents. Um, and, and, I, and I think it's, it's part of this whole broken payment system that we, that we have. We as doctors aren't paid for health care, unfortunately. We're paid for rescue care. I know that better than anyone is an emergency physician. Reverend, I think you were next. So I just simply wanted to offer up the, a couple of observations. I think one of the silent and most important partners in the issue related to end-of-life care is actually the faith community. Um, I have a stack beside my desk of the uh, healthcare proxies, and taken as a part of my mission to actually have those conversations with families prior to crises and put them on file with myself and encourage them to do that work. And I also teach the death and dying, sociology of death and dying at Worcester State. So having this conversation That's with 20 somethings and, and giving them the documents and saying, I'm not requiring you as a matter of course to sign this. I want you to see it, understand it, and when you're ready, uh, if you're ever ready to fill it out, do so. On Rodney's issue, I'm wondering about this larger community partnership where we bring together faith communities, uh, you know, regional development uh, corporations, uh, the, the uh, food banks, and so forth to begin to come up with a community-wide 
provide strategy for, for permeating the community with these kinds of sensibilities. And I'm wondering what you... What yeah, and it, you know, it, it, it takes uh, a single... Can one, I have to tell you, I, I, I have not thought enough about bringing in um, the local faith-based leaders in terms of that conversation. And uh, we tend to call at the end, right? And you, you, what you're saying is, think about us at the beginning in terms of having, and uh, it, it's, it's absolutely a wonderful idea and makes coming here and giving the talk all the worthwhile to get a great idea like that um, uh, from you. And we'll, we'll certainly reflect on that. I think it, 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 takes, it takes a village, right? It takes a community coming together and it takes a spark to start with. Um, uh, I, we have in, in Worcester a great number of colleges. There's a healthcare delivery institute now at WPI. I don't know if anybody's uh, uh, affiliated with WPI. My hope once, and I've tried to stimulate them, is that they'll take the ball and run with it and try to get all the pieces together. Um, I've, I've done this talk at the Worcester, Worcester Chamber of Commerce. I, I'm sorry if anybody had to sit through it twice. Uh, but it's, it's a, to try to get the business, uh, businesses together uh, to be thinking about this as well. So I, you know, w the more dialogue that occurs around the community about how we can work together on this, the better. I haven't figured out the secret sauce yet, though. I haven't, I, I'm, so I'm just getting out on my, um, my soapbox here and, 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 and preaching, I guess, at some level about how we need to do this. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's an industry that could use a little regulation, right? <laughs> I, I, th I think some people may have heard about the story about um, the new $1,000 a day hepatitis C drug, right? And, and this is almost curative for patients that take it. And most of the patients um, that are getting that right now are on Medicaid. And so for the Medicaid program, they're now paying $1,000 per day for one pill for a patient. And, uh, I wish I could remember um, the pharmaceutical company that makes it so I can throw them under the bus right now. Uh, but that's absolutely ridiculous. That's just gouging. Um, it, it, it's gouging not only um, uh, the patients and the, and the uh, it's gouging the states that are paying for that. It's largely the Medicaid programs. One uh, insurance company, Neighborhood Health Plan, that covers primarily Medicaid beneficiaries. Um, is it lost a hundred million dollars because of that, and this year. Um, so I, I think for us, that we have, we have oh, one more okay, I, I would call for greater regulation of what can be charged for pharmaceutical. It's truly price, price gouging, and I think uh, is it Fred, yeah. uh, one of our so caregivers. As a uh, uh, watcher employee in the medical school, I just want to know your thoughts on the Uh, that's a that's a great it's a great question and I, I, I appreciate it especially for somebody that we've been connected with at the medical school for so many years. Um, I, I think that it's it's pretty clear that what the population eats has a much greater impact on the total cost of health care than um, on the on the total health of, of a nation than any part of the healthcare system, right? So, um, so I think that if you're looking at what's gonna happen, the demographics and where, what, what the big diseases of the future are and the problems, it's neurodegenerative disease, people living longer, getting Alzheimer's, very, very expensive to care for, and, and it is diabetes, uh, which is primarily a disease of, um, of what you eat. So I, I, those are big, big things, and, 
anything you see in terms of uh, community efforts to improve the eating habits of kids, especially when they're young, that's what you get it with them. That's when you when you get them. It's uh, key, and we do a lot with the United Way. I'm the I'll just give a plug to the United Way. I am the uh, co-chair for the Central Mass United Way. Every program we fund is related uh, for summer camps has a component about healthy eating for kids. So that's probably probably the big one. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. For Thank you very much. Have a token uh, oh, thank members you. For, for coming here. Too. I, I really appreciate that. And we get there you to go. Our picture. <laughs>